Good morning, everyone. Yesterday, August 13th, marked five months since I first declared a state of emergency so we could respond to this once in a century global pandemic. Under that order, we took significant action to avoid huge surges of COVID-19, which are impacting the healthcare systems of neighboring states like New York and Massachusetts. What's important for us to remember is that we're in a different place then uh, than we are now. Today, we have a lot more testing and contact tracing capacity to contain the virus, and we've increased inventory of PPE. We still have health and safety measures statewide, and our individual behavior is also much different today. And businesses have taken steps to help reduce the risk of spreading the virus, like working re remotely, separating workstations, changing schedules, wearing masks, improving ventilation, and helping customers stay six feet apart. Five months ago, when cases and deaths were first spiking, we weren't wearing masks. No one knew what social distancing meant. Many weren't thinking about washing their hands multiple times a day, much less for a full 20 seconds. And sadly, folks were much more likely to go out or go to work, even if they felt sick. My point is this. We know so much more about the virus now, have more tools, and have taken many steps to slow the spread. With all that we learned, and with your hard work, we suppress the virus here in Vermont. And this has allowed us to methodically reopen all sectors of the economy to some degree since late April. We've consistently been able to move forward, while many other states have had to scale back, or even worse, have had to close down sectors they once reopened. But because we've been disciplined, respectful, informed, and smart, we're safer as a result. And because we're safer, we've been able to put large numbers of Vermonters back to work, including from sectors like manufacturing, retail, healthcare, childcare, construction, and those in salons, restaurants, hotels, and more, joining essential workers who never left the front lines. And because we've been methodical about it, even as we've reopened, we've seen our case counts and positivity rates stay amongst the lowest in the country. Again, this approach has allowed us to consistently move forward. It's important to note that we've still had clusters and outbreaks, but we've been able to contain each of them so it hasn't spread broadly into the community. And Dr. Levine is going to talk about that more in a moment. Importantly, for many months, we've seen minimal hospitalizations. And while sadly, we've seen 58 COVID deaths since March, 52 of those came before we really started reopening the economy. We should be proud of what we've done, but at the same time, given what the rest of the country is facing, every one of us must stay vigilant. This means wearing a mask when around others, staying six feet apart, washing your hands a lot, staying home when sick or have been exposed to someone with COVID, and following our travel guidance. These steps are more important than ever as college students return and our K-12 schools begin to offer some level of in-person instruction. Because as we've heard Dr. from Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, and Dr. Bell, we all have a role to play to keep the numbers in our community as low as possible. This is the most important thing we can do for our kids, families, and school employees. So it should come as no surprise that today I'm extending the state of emergency for another month. Again, this is a vehicle that allows us to manage and continue to suppress this virus. And as college students return to school, there are some additional tools for municipalities included in this order as well. To start, it gives cities and towns the ability to lower the limit on gathering size. And it lets them limit hours for the sale of alcohol, meaning they could set a curfew for bars and clubs. Looking at case growth, uh, growth uh, in other states and hearing from other governors about what they saw and what they did, 
it appears uncontrolled parties in crowds at bars and clubs are a big part of the problem. So I believe giving our towns, especially the college towns, some additional mitigation measures to work with is the right thing to do. Now, based on some of the questions we've been getting and some of, uh, uh, of how our approach is being characterized, I'm going to address some anticipated concerns up front. As I said at the beginning, we've learned and we've done a lot since March and April. Our response has been one of the most effective in the country. And we continue to adapt our approach based on new facts and the data uh, we track in real time with the input of our world-class health experts. With this approach, we have a proven strategy for taking steps to prevent spread and reopen Vermont. We always have and always will put the health of Vermonters first, always. So working closely with our health experts, we found ways to open to the greatest extent possible while keeping community infections low. In fact, as of today, we have the lowest number of cases per capita in the country. We've achieved this balance by prioritizing openings based on what we need to be open in person for public health, safety, and economic security. This includes hospitals, doctors, offices, dentists, childcare, manufacturing, and yes, now our schools to some extent, though they were just beginning the process of opening, and many of them have taken a hybrid approach. The unfortunate reality is, in order to uh, manage the reopening of these priority areas and monitor the rate of spread, we continue to ask other sectors, like lodging and hospitality, to make enormous sacrifices. And it's why we encourage workers who can continue to work remotely to do so. Because just like Dr. Levine tells us to keep track of the number of contacts we have each day, our reopening strategy has to consider the same thing across all sectors. For example, that's why I've directed state employees who can work remotely to continue to do so until the end of the year. It's not because it's unsafe for them to come into work. It's because it's an opportunity to significantly reduce the number of person-to-person -person contacts, which will keep the risk lower for sectors where they need to have in-person activities. This is part of the measured, strategic, and scientific approach we've taken throughout this crisis. It's why I'm giving our communities, especially the college towns, the ability to further limit some high contact and activities as we increase the number of people in those areas. Again, it's about prioritizing where contact must occur versus where we may not need it. Our proven approach has also uh, meant we'll be methodical and watch the data closely, never let our guard down, and be flexible and quick to respond to changes. So I'm going to continue to watch the data and ask, her, ask the experts how we're doing every single day to make sure we're on the right track. And as we've proven over the last five months, if the data or the expert advice changes, we'll have the courage to act in the interests of public health, regardless of the political ramifications. So if Vermonters are wondering if we'll act quickly, if the situation on the ground changes, the answer is yes, absolutely. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Dr. Levine. Good morning. I'm going to be talking today about colleges, about contact tracing, and about outbreaks. Let's start with colleges and universities, many of which are already having students returning to their campuses. We've been preparing with these institutions for months now to answer questions, think about what in-person learning looks like, and develop reopening guidance tailored to their needs. 
It's been a complicated effort to bring together students from many different places to figure out how to educate, house, and feed them safely while also keeping faculty, staff, and the community healthy. We've said many times in all of our conversations about restarting Vermont that we expect to see cases of COVID-19, and colleges and universities are no exception. Because of the unique nature of the campus setting, our guidance asks for colleges to come up with a plan to test students at entry. This testing has already begun with many hundreds of results reported so far. We already know a few students have indeed tested positive, and at least one positive result came back before the student even left their home state, delaying their intended arrival date. While we understand hearing about new cases of COVID-19 is cause for concern, these positive tests mean the system is working. We want to find these so we know who needs to stay inside and away from other people so we can prevent the virus from spreading any further. The combined early testing and quarantine protocols the colleges have all put into place will enable them to protect the health and safety of students, staff, and community as the fall semester gets underway. Because of the testing protocols and other steps our colleges and universities have already taken to protect their community, a positive case will not put in motion a large college-wide testing effort or community-wide testing. We'll use our proven method of contact tracing to make sure we quickly identify those who need to isolate or quarantine in order to contain any potential spread within the school and the community. We will strategically target testing to each situation so we can be on the ready for any future needs. I want to thank the colleges and universities for their partnership in finding ways to develop a high quality educational experience while keeping us all safe and healthy. Since I just mentioned contact tracing, let's talk about that next. Today, NPR ran a piece on contact tracing and the transparency of states with their contact tracing data. I want to point out that on July 10th, in our weekly update on the VDH website, we highlighted, highlighted contact tracing. I'd like to present a few facts and bullet points to you all regarding this. First of all, just to review what it is, obviously a case of COVID-19 is interviewed and contact tracers obtain information on close contacts during the case's period of being infectious. Those contacts are then notified and provided with public health guidance. Both contacts and cases are asked to participate in the automated symptom monitoring tool that we call SARA Alert. Since April 1st, 2,031 contacts have been named, some of these twice. 1,523 individual people have been named as contacts. 184 named contacts have gone on to be cases. The average number of cases, sorry, the average number of close contacts per infected person is three contacts per case. 28% of contacts have been tested in their eligible period which is in within 14 days of their exposure. This does not mean they have been tested at another time. And keep in mind, it is the actual quarantining and not the testing that is preventive here. Cumulatively, the majority of cases, 90%, are interviewed within 24 hours, 96% within 48 hours. And in the last 14 days, 97% of cases have been interviewed in the last 24 hours and 99% in the last 48 hours. Since June 1st, 11% of contacts have gone on to become cases. And in the past two weeks, only 2.1% of contacts have become cases. For those who've been identified through contact tracing, these numbers should be somewhat reassuring. Now let me move on finally uh, to the topic of outbreak. 
On Wednesday of this week, at a press conference with Winooski Mayor Christine Lott and Burlington Mayor Miro Weinberger, we announced the formal end of the state's first significant outbreak and community spread of COVID-19. This was the state's first and largest outbreak and community spread of virus. Now, after two full incubation periods, which means 28 days total, with no new cases, this outbreak is considered resolved. I'm really pleased to report this, but at the same time, we know the pandemic is far from over. In the course of this outbreak, we should remember that 117 of our neighbors, friends, and family members were test positive or actually sick, and several were hospitalized. And Vermont has new cases each day, though fortunately far fewer than most other states. And another outbreak can happen at any moment, so we must all continue to take precautions to prevent the spread of virus. But nonetheless, this is a success story on many levels and a good example and a precedent for managing outbreaks. I encourage Vermonters to make note of this broad-based and successful response. It's not that it's government coming in to fix everything. This pandemic requires individual, community, and state partnership. Key to our success here has been the ability to have effective community engagement to reach the various populations where they are and to share actionable information in timely and in culturally sensitive and linguistically appropriate ways. With partners like Association of Africans Living in Vermont and the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants who make all the difference and help us reach people where they are. Only by being there will help that matters for every Vermonter we will be able to keep cases low stamp out any outbreaks, and work together to navigate our way through this pandemic. And I want to talk for a moment about your everyday actions. Behavior change is the hardest thing to do, whether it's quitting smoking, changing eating habits, or any of the day-to-day -day actions that we're used to. But here's what I see around the state. Most people in the state understand that it does take hard work and sacrifice to keep our loved ones safe from this potentially dangerous and very contagious virus. And we don't know how long it will go. Many of us are experiencing COVID fatigue. At the same time, we can see what happens when we let our guard down and move too quickly to get back to normal. In states that have done this, the virus roars back up when we let up. We want our kids to be safe at school learning from teachers who don't also have to fear for their health and that of their families. We want to gather with friends. We want to visit with loved ones. And we can and we will. It will just take time and commitment to do everything possible to get through this as fast as possible without the risk of losing the fragile gains we've made. I think uh, someone else on this stage has said before, this is a marathon. But informed by the science and everyone doing their part, physical distancing, wearing masks, you know the drill, then we will get to the point where we won't have to do it any longer and we will get there all the much sooner. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, first, as a reminder for those who are watching at home, today's presentation, as always, can be found on our department's website, dfr.vermont.gov. Uh, we'll begin uh, today again with an overview of our national and regional data before returning to a review uh, of the data this past week uh, in Vermont and finally close with an update uh, to our travel map. This past week, the United States again surpassed a grim milestone recording its 5 millionth COVID-19 case. But for the first time, the United States did see a slowdown in how quickly we added an additional 1 million cases. As discussed previously, it took us nearly 100 days to record our first 1 million COVID cases. That was shortened to 43 days for the second 
Uh, it was shortened to 28 days for the third, 15 for the fourth. And now, as cases have slowed and plateaued across the country, uh, it took the U.S. 17 days to record its next million, now surpassing a total of 5 million cases. Looking at the four U.S. Census regions in the, in the country, we see that the most significant declines have come in the South, with the West, the Midwest, and the Northeast largely plateauing at their recently reported case levels. Again, this is good news that cases are not growing at the moment, but as we've said many times in the past, the United States is still reporting an extremely high number of daily cases, which unfortunately will mean that more severe illness and more deaths are likely across the country in the weeks to come. As a Harvard public health expert explained this week, we really need to figure out how to deal with the pandemic as a whole country because cases anywhere elevate the risk of spread across the entirety of the United States. We did see some good news with a continued reduction in hospital needs across the U.S. with the 15th consecutive day of less people in the hospital with COVID-19. Similarly, the number of people with ICU needs decreased for the last seven days. But unfortunately, we see that new deaths just continue to stay high and stay steady. Over 1,000 Americans have died from the coronavirus each of the last 17 days. Further, the reported death toll on Wednesday of this week was just over 1,500 deaths, which was the highest reported death count since May 15th. Again, as we mentioned, we're likely to see these numbers stay high and steady as death is unfortunately a lagging indicator and we see our cases still remain quite high across the country. Turning now to better news closer to home in the Northeast, we see that we saw just over a 7% drop uh, in weekly cases compared to last week. This marks the second consecutive week of case decline in the Northeast and is in fact our largest percent decline in over seven weeks. Looking more specifically at Vermont, we continue to see very steady trends in our own numbers. New case growth was roughly flat this week at 39 new cases. Vermont continues to hold the distinction of having the lowest total case count in the U.S. And as the governor mentioned, now this week, we also have the lowest case count on a per capita basis as well, a rather impressive achievement for our state. The rest of our restart metrics remain stable this week and don't present uh, any current risk at the moment. Syndromic surveillance continues to uh, show that very few people are visiting the emergency room uh, or urgent care facilities, well below our guardrail. Uh, and this number has really remained quite stable and quite low throughout the entirety of the summer. Vermont's three and seven day viral growth rates again continue very low this week, below 1% um, and nowhere near the type of sustained growth that would give us concern. On test positivity, again, our seven-day rolling average is trending very favorably and is low at 0.7%, again, safely below and well below, in fact, our 5% guardrail on that metric. And then last and finally, we see that ICU availability continues uh, to trend favorably below the 30% buffer uh, and that there are currently two individuals in the hospital, one in the ICU, um, and we wish them a full and speedy recovery. Turning now to the uh, Vermont forecast, uh, we can see that uh, our model is predicting a very slight uptick in cases over the next few weeks. However, I do want to emphasize that uh, these predicted case counts are still very low, uh, well under 10 new cases a day uh, on average. However, something that we do need to consider, and as Dr. Levine mentioned, is the fact uh, that Vermont has a very robust uh, testing requirement for colleges and universities as their students return to campus over the next three weeks. Many of these students are returning from areas of the country with a higher disease prevalence than Vermont. Um, this combined with the robust testing program uh, means that we are likely to see spikes in our case counts over the next three weeks as these cases are identified, their contacts are traced, and the students are safely isolated. So that, as Dr. Levine said, is really a success of the protocols that are put in place to safely reopen higher ed when we do see those college-related spikes over the weeks ahead. Turning now to our travel map update, uh, again, we saw another week of decreases across the Northeast, which means that more people are eligible to travel to Vermont quarantine-free. 
This week, approximately 5.9 million individuals from uh, 93 counties across our travel region can travel to Vermont without a quarantine. This is an increase of about 700,000 compared to last week. And looking most closely at the map, we can see that the improvement is largely in the Northeast with Maine and New Hampshire combined only having three counties that require a quarantine. Uh, while other parts of the travel map like uh, Rhode Island, Delaware, and Maryland don't have a single county that's eligible for quarantine free travel to Vermont and Ohio, New Jersey, and Virginia each having only one or two quarantine free counties. So again, much of the gains have been focused uh, in the Northeast. Uh, ending here on a question from last week about how our travel metrics uh, compare to the standards employed by others around us, particularly New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, uh, I wanted to just emphasize that New York and Connecticut and New Jersey require a seven-day rolling average of fewer than 10 positive cases per 100,000, while another metric that we've measured ourselves against the European Union mandates a two-week uh, total below 14 positive cases per 100,000. So all of these numbers can be quite complex and difficult to understand. So I think we just wanted to visualize this difference uh, with the map that we see on the screen. Uh, we can see this difference and the fact that uh, by evaluating ourselves on a county by county basis to New York, uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, and the EU, uh, that uh, New York employs a much less conservative standard when determining their quarantine requirements. Much of the Northeast, much of the Mid-Atlantic uh, would be allowed to travel to Vermont uh, without a 14-day quarantine. The European Union does impose more strict standards than Vermont. Um, as you can see, under their system, many states would have no green counties at all, uh, even areas that are seeing pretty low case counts across the Northeast. However, again, when comparing these three standards together, we see that Vermont really does strike a balance and has a more conservative approach, certainly than New York Connecticut and New Jersey, um, and approach that is functionally similar uh, to the EU rather than to New York. Uh, we're confident, again, that this standard will help protect the Vermont economy while keeping Vermonters uh, safe and healthy. Last, I just also want to mention that uh, this new travel map uh, has been updated for now 30 days, and over that 30-day period, we've seen over 1.2 million interactions with the travel map. Uh, this is really giving us a high degree of confidence that there's great awareness about our policies and our requirements um, and that people are trying to uh, comply with them, which is great news. So at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions. We'll start with Calvin. Uh, thank you, Governor. So, um, First about the announcement about bars and clubs. I imagine that a lot of business owners are might take concern with this, seeing as how they've been hit the hardest, arguably, so far. Um, like with the mask mandate uh, at first, why not expand this bar and club um, local control mandate? Why not put that on a state level? Why do town by town basis? Uh, because, to be perfectly fr frank, um, it looks to me uh, like Burlington is the, is the most susceptible uh, to a high traffic count, a uh, lot of people getting together, um, and with the uh, students coming in uh, from uh, to UVM, Champlain, uh, St. Mike's, and so forth, that's where they go. And uh, so we wanted to cater to that. Uh, I don't believe that it's a problem in Island Pond up in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, or Enosburg or uh, down in the southern part of the state, it really is uh, about uh, those saturated areas like Burlington. So we wanted to give flexibility. We knew that there were some concerns. I knew there were some concerns uh, from the mayor, uh, Burlington in particular, and uh, thought that this was the best approach uh, to, to giving them the ability to know what's on, on the ground and do what's right for their own community because they know it better than we do. And um, second question, I just kind of want to shift a bit to what's going on down in Washington, Congress, and what appears or what's to be, not going on. What's <laughs> not going on, exactly. What appears to be uh, nothing's happening. So I'm just wondering if, if you've had conversations maybe with Governors Baker or Sununu to um, try to either put some pressure on the RGA or where they could maybe turn up the heat or try to make some movement down in D.C. You know, um, the National Governors Association um, 
Governor Baker uh, is uh, is uh, part of that group as well. Uh, we've talked uh, extensively about uh, what we think we need as states, more flexibility, uh, more resources, um, some like Title 32. I mean, we put a lot of measures in place. We've done it in writing. Uh, we've done it uh, uh, publicly and privately, and we're doing all we can uh, as, as uh, governors on both sides of the aisle uh, trying to to work with our congressional delegations. Uh, you know, we don't have a problem with ours, um, but, uh, but certainly there's some influence in other states uh, where it's, uh, it's across party lines. So that's been helpful, uh, but, uh, but again, um, it doesn't appear uh, that there's any movement at this point in time where we thought there would be. Um, but we'll see. Uh, we're still hopeful, uh, but we'll still uh, continue to do what we think we can do best here in Vermont. Uh, to help uh, Vermonters in the region and our businesses, and uh, but I but I would hope that the uh, that Washington uh, would uh, would get together and do what's right for for the all the states. And my quick follow up earlier this week, you said that your administration is looking into the feasibility of using CARES Act funds for this newest employment. Uh, potentially. I mean, is there any update to that? Or? Yeah, I mean, there's been some dialogue uh, with the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, there's been nothing that I know of at this point in time in writing. Um, it's a little complicated, uh, but we believe there's a path forward, and we're going to continue uh, to move in that direction. But nothing in writing at this point. So um, we'll react. We're anticipating uh, what we need to do uh, to meet those standards. And uh, we'll have to, as well, uh, work with the legislature to see if we can use any of the CARES uh, money, uh, which they'll have to uh, approve, uh, to utilize for the extra $100 on top of the $300 for uh, the extra money for unemployment and uh, the PUA. So we're working on it um, to the best of our ability, uh, but without anything in writing, uh, and again, um, makes it a little difficult uh, to put the plan in action. But we're, we're trying to anticipate every step along the way. Thank you. David? Uh, let's see. Good question. I'm um, sort of looking at the um, economic forecast we had and also uh, on the campaign trail. David Zuckerman had uh, indicated he uh, might favor dipping into the state's savings uh, to try and fill the hole. Is that anything you'd ever consider? Are we anywhere near a threshold to that, or to try and address some of the economic problems? Is it more a matter of trying to find, you know, whatever it would be, some $200 million in cuts to try and address some of those issues? Yeah, I think you'll find out, uh, you know, we're working on the, the budget that we'll present to the legislature uh, next week. Uh, and we'll, uh, um, I think you'll see a balance of, of uh, efficiencies, uh, I'll say, uh, with using some one-time money and so forth. Um, but uh, but I would say we're not uh, at this point uh, looking to dip into the reserves. But that it doesn't take it off the table. Um, we're fortunate to have all of our rainy day reserves uh, flush, filled, and ready to go if necessary. But uh, we were fortunate. Um, you know, as I said before, um, we we ended up uh, last year um, balancing out. Okay, we had money left over on the bottom line, so we're able to use some of that money. Uh, for the next year. I'm more concerned about the next year, but can you imagine uh, had we uh, not had this pandemic, what kind of shape we'd be in, what kind of surplus we might have? It would probably have been a record in some respects, uh, which is unfortunate, but on the, on the positive side, uh, we had that uh, to get us through that year uh, where we had one quarter that was devastated uh, and, um, and be able to use some of the surplus uh, and uh, to move into next year to help balance out the budget. So we're going to have something that I think is reasonable, and, uh, and we'll see what the legislature does with it from there. But I will also say, um, with the uncertainty in Washington, uh, we don't know about the, un the, the flexibility. We don't know whether you can utilize any of the uh, CARES money or, or uh, uh, CRF uh, money uh, for our budgets and uh, deficits in particular. So without that, we're gonna present something that's in real time, uh, what we have to deal with today, uh, but it could change based on what they do. And if they appropriate more money, we'll be able to do do more. So it's um, we have to maintain our nimbleness, our, our flexibility, 
um, but we'll present a reasonable bu budget next uh, next week. Sure. And um, a question: You sort of talked a little bit about Burlington and the students coming back, um, and there being some concern, at least certainly from the mayor. Um, he's expressed that he's not quite content with the measures UVM has taken to try and prevent an outbreak of COVID-19 as students return from all the places they will. Um, do you believe UVM has done enough to prevent an outbreak and to sort of try and keep our numbers low? Um, I guess what degrees are concerned? Well, again, um, so far, so good. I mean, they are testing, as they said they would, uh, students coming in. Uh, we have found uh, that uh, they found uh, that there are some who are positive. Um, and that's in some respects good news that they were caught before they came in uh, where they could infect a, a much larger population. So that's working. Um, again, we'll have to watch uh, as we move forward. Uh, we want them to be dil dil uh, diligent and vigilant and, uh, and, and follow through on everything they said they would do. Um, but that's why giving this uh, uh, more flexibility to the um, mayor of uh, Burlington uh, in terms of the, the size of, of uh, gatherings, uh, as well as to uh, possibly a, a curfew on bars and clubs, I thought was a good step forward uh, that might put him at ease a bit uh, in, uh, in terms of mitigating uh, the spread within the community. Um, I might ask uh, Dr. Levine, uh, he's worked with the uh, um, colleges and universities uh, may be commenting on the first week. Yeah. No, there are ongoing conversations going all the time between the health department, the state, the city of Burlington, the universities that are present in that area, and uh, they're all incredibly productive. Um, I think that things have even in the last few days uh, in, improved in terms of the level of communication and the decision making that's gone around various uh, back to school protocols, if you will. Um, we're very encouraged by the fact that um, there's been great transparency in the data and uh, communication and looking for guidance on the appropriate courses of action uh, each time positives result. Uh, so I won't speak for the mayor, but the mayor uh, has been involved in a lot of these discussions, and I think things are working very well in terms of uh, making sure the university has a sense of accountability for what it needs to do to uh, mitigate when situations arise. And uh, there's uh, wonderful communication that's ongoing. Thank you both. Steve? On topic. Um, you, the administration's been hammered by the Vermont NEA on the whole back to school thing. Um, I guess a response to that, have you, have you heard what they're saying and do you have a response to a fairly heavy criticism from uh, the NEA? Well, first of all, I, I, would, uh, I would also say this isn't unique to Vermont. In uh, speaking to other governors throughout the country, uh, they're experiencing the exact same thing. So this is a national effort with a lot of the same talking points. Um, we, uh, again, I can't um, say it enough, we're unique uh, in many respects uh, here in Vermont. When I speak with other governors, again, throughout the country, uh, where some of them have 10, 20 percent positivity rates, and we're uh, under uh, 1 percent, we're a half a percent, or under a half a percent, um, we are so much different uh, than, than others, even with our case count down, um, and so uh, they, uh, uh, in speaking with some of them, uh, they don't understand why we're getting any pushback uh, because uh, most states have some measure of getting back to school. Um, and, uh, and it follows right in line with what we're trying to do, allowing for as much flexibility, keeping people as safe as possible, and, uh, and trying to prove ourselves uh, as we move forward. But we're listening. They've been at the table. Um, we've. Uh, uh, we've exchanged ideas and and uh, and trying to to do what we can to to do this in the appropriate manner. Um, but um, but the bottom line for me, you know, and taking all the steps that we've taken, has been I think it's important for kids uh, to get that instruction, that education, uh, and from a social aspect as well as from an educational aspect. And uh, and I think we're going to have if we don't, we're going to have a lot of kids slipping through the cracks, and we'll see the ramifications of this inaction 
uh, in years to come if we don't take the steps now. So uh, we're moving forward. The hybrid approach gives the flexibility. If something uh, goes wrong, we'll go to uh, uh, remote learning. Uh, but if there's if everything goes well, uh, they can uh, transition to to in-person learning. Um, I might ask Secretary French if there anything you'd like to add to that. Uh, oh, Heather, I'm sorry. Good morning. <laughs> Deputy good morning, Secretary Boucher. Governor. Good morning, Governor. Thank you um, for the question. I could not uh, hear, unfortunately, who actually asked it. Um, I, yeah, uh, not, uh, everything that uh, the Governor said, we hardly support. The only thing I would add is that, yes, we are listening very carefully and very closely. Uh, we will be today releasing our social, emotional, mental health guidance. And that is an important component of really helping to ensure that our teachers, our staff, and our students all feel safe and comfortable. Again, based on based on the evidence that's at hand, um, but we really are taking it seriously, and, and I think have um, acted uh, in good faith and have actually worked hard with a variety of different stakeholders to do what we can to ensure that our local districts are actually taking this seriously as well. I, I would also, while we're talking about this, um, some of the criticism has been that we haven't given enough guidance uh, to the to the schools, uh, that we're leaving it all up to them. And I would uh, have to say uh, that we've, uh, we've taken a lot of steps in providing guidance. And I'll just read a list of some of this. Um, we have uh, health and health screening requirements and specific uh, protocols, guidance for at-risk school staff, guidance for students with special health and education uh, educational needs, bus protocols, drop-off and pickup protocols, hand washing protocols, facial covering protocols, PPE uh, protocols, cleaning and disinfect uh, disinfecting uh, protocols, physical distancing and classroom breakout, large group activities, uh, communal spaces, volunteer and visitor restrictions, building considerations including vending machines, water fountains, health office, offices, ventilation, floor markings, and more, food service guidance, social and emotional support for staff and students, communications recommendations, contracting tracing details. So we, uh, we've given a lot, and, and just as a, a visual here, this is our guidance. I mean, you can see it's, it's fairly substantial. Um, so it's not as though we've taken a hands-off approach. We're trying to do what we can in this really unprecedented time uh, where, you know, there's no playbook here. Uh, and we're doing uh, the best we can to work together uh, because this is, shouldn't be, isn't, from my standpoint, an us versus them type of approach. We want to do what's right for everyone. But the kids, the kids are my first priority. Very good. And, and finally, uh, Governor or Mike, maybe, uh, Ariel Cuero says, uh, has uh, pled today. Um, I think Mikey came out with a statement, but uh, punishment-wise, and, and it, I mean, has justice been served here, or what do you think? Um, from my standpoint, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Pichak to, to comment. From my standpoint, um, I think uh, it's, it's taken a long time, um, but uh, in some respects, uh, maybe we all knew uh, that he was guilty, uh, and he finally admitted to, to that. Uh, so from that standpoint, it's, uh, it's a step forward. Uh, but I'll let Commissioner Pichak answer further. Uh, thank you, Steve. So, yeah, we uh, put out a statement that, you know, certainly during the course of our 10-month investigation, we traced every investor penny. Uh, we found that much of that money had been inappropriately diverted to Mr. Kiros, largely to fund a lavish lifestyle. So for us, his doubt, his, his guilt was never beyond doubt. Uh, that was something that uh, we were quite certain in. So we were happy to see that Mr. Kiros sort of faced that reality, has taken responsibility for his actions. Uh, certainly the plea um, is a good thing, but it, it certainly can't undo the harm that was um, inflicted on the Northeast Kingdom. You know, that uh, will certainly help heal that wound and help that community continue to move forward. Uh, but there's still a lot of work that has to be done uh, in the kingdom. In terms of the sentencing, we won't know the exact sentence until um, the rest of the cases are resolved against uh, the other defendants, including Bill Stanger. 
so they have capped it at, at eight years um, in the settlement agreement. Um, certainly, I know probably any amount of time isn't uh, what Vermonters uh, think is sufficient, but when you look at other cases across the country and even similar cases in Vermont, um, it's, much, it's pretty much in line with those cases. All right, we'll move to the phone, starting with Kathy from the Associated Press. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify with uh, Dr. Levine, is it just one case that we are aware of of a college student testing positive for the virus at home before arriving in Vermont? And can you also uh, tell us if you had to uh, hire more staff or contact tracing as we near the start of school? Yes, great questions. So it is just one case from somebody prior to Vermont uh, out of uh, many hundreds of tests that were done, but there are thousands more tests to be done at home uh, that we'll hear about in ensuing weeks. So uh, stay tuned is all I can say for that. And with regard to contact tracing, our current staff has been quite up to the task. Uh, we actually have, uh, on an accelerated timeline, increased the training of several other staff. And we're augmenting the ranks as we speak by another four individuals, not because we're falling behind or because the work has been overloaded, uh, but as an anticipatory thing, uh, knowing the numbers of students that uh, we'll come back to Vermont in total. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Uh, glad to be honest with you today. Uh, didn't have good enough reception on Tuesday. So, um, I wanted to start with a question for Mark Levine. Dr. Um, a lot of experts are expecting a vaccine in the next few months or, or even early 2021. I'm wondering what uh, the health department is doing to plan ahead for the rollout of the vaccine. Um, and if it were up to you, who should get the, the first round, uh, understanding that there probably won't be enough for everybody? Great. A bunch of questions about vaccine. So. To, to start, um, you can find your expert and they will tell you when they think we'll have a vaccine. And some will say by election day, others will say early 21, others are still talking in the latter half of 21 or even later. Uh, I'm not gonna profess to have uh, the answer on that, except to say that things are moving extraordinarily fast terms of the amount of uh, work that's been done, the number of candidate vaccines that are going into phase three trials uh, in the near future, that's a very rapid timeline. But then you have to say, well, what does the phase three trial show? Uh, was it a efficacious vaccine? Was there any harm associated with it? Um, this takes time. So put that on the table first. Second thing, has to do with uh, Vermont's preparedness. So as I've implied, we don't need to be prepared for October, but we do need to be prepared, hopefully for something faster than we might have imagined previously. So we have an entire uh, cross health department and cross AHS and cross uh, state government task force addressing all of the necessary issues, many of which have to do with actual um, ability to deliver the vaccine to a person, whether that be with the appropriate syringes, needles, things of that level of detail, logistical issues. Some of them have to do with uh, storage and transport of the vaccine. Some of them have to do with actually how do we get our appropriate share uh, in coordination with the federal government. 
And while we're doing all of that work statewide, obviously the federal government is also doing some ground laying work, if you will, uh, because uh, they understand that this needs to, if, if there's nothing else that's happened in this pandemic that's had national coordination, this is something everybody seems to have coalesced around. It needs national coordination uh, to make sure that states aren't fighting with one another, governors aren't wheeling and dealing and things of that sort, that vaccine is available to the population at large. So a, w a lot more coordination going on between sectors of the federal government like CDC, FDA, et cetera, and uh, state in the states. Uh, lastly, um, the third part of your question had to do with uh, who should get priority. Uh, and that won't be uh, necessarily a public health decision at every state level either. That will be a much more nationally coordinated effort. But you can bet that the highest priority groups for the initial delivery of the vaccine will be those who work in the healthcare sector and those who we have traditionally considered in the most vulnerable groups, which of course include people of certain ages, people with certain underlying uh, chronic medical conditions, people who have immunosuppressive illnesses, etc. Uh, those will be the first sort of uh, priority candidates for the vaccine before it gets to what we would term the more general population. Does that cover it, Greg? Yeah, I think that uh, that does pretty good. Um, Governor, uh, quick question for you, and uh, let's move on. I know you have a, a bunch of people today. Um, given that this is the first time we've uh, gotten to chat with you since the election, um, I'd, I'd kind of like to pick your brain on your take on the on the Democrat pick for governor. Uh, it's his voting history as an anti-vaxxer, I'm wondering if you were surprised that he was elected and uh, how that changes your strategy going forward, either with the virus or with your re-election. Well, my, my strategy uh, in the election hasn't changed. It, it never does. Um, I'm going to talk about what I can bring to the table uh, and not uh, specifically call out uh, what uh, my opponent cannot. So. I think you'll see that I've done that for the last 20 years. I always run a positive campaign, and I'll continue to do so. So I think we'll see, you know, stark differences between the two of us. Uh, but he's a formidable uh, candidate and formidable opponent, opponent, and uh, has a lot of name recognition and uh, a lot of history, as I do. So should be an interesting, uh, interesting campaign during unusual times. Uh, were you surprised, given his? former voting history on such a, a hot topic at this point in time that, that Democratic voters uh, picked him? I, no, I mean, I, I would say that uh, I, I wasn't sure wh which way it was going to land. Um, I thought it was uh, fairly close. It seemed like a close race from the outside, but, um, but I wouldn't have been surprised if either uh, Rebecca Holcomb or um, Dave Zuckerman had, uh, had won. It wouldn't have, either one wouldn't have surprised me. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Mike? All right, uh, we'll go to Kat, WCAX. Hi. So looking at the data from today, um, I noticed that Commissioner Pichek said to watch for spikes as college students return. Got me wondering whether the state still has surge sites set up for COVID-19. Were those all dismantled or are some of them still up? Because I know some were at the colleges. Um, I might refer to Commissioner Sherling, um, who can give us a, an update on that. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, yes, there are uh, search sites that are still uh, still set up. They're they're dormant. They're not uh, staffed, and uh, they do stand ready for any potential surge uh, that we may face in the fall. Where are those? There's one in Rutland and one in Essex that are the two remaining 
uh, sites, and we also have uh, equipment staged and ready to deploy at additional search sites if necessary. And then this might be a better question for Commissioner Pichak. Looking at the hospital data, it seems like while we are well within the parameters that the state considers safe for reopening, there are still a lot of beds full in hospitals. Is that a concern if we may see potential increases in cases? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Certainly, um, the 30% buffer that we have was sort of designed uh, to make sure that uh, when cases do come and we see a large increase in cases, uh, that we have some time to put the brakes on before uh, the critical care beds fill up. So we're under that 30% buffer, so we do have plenty of space in the ICU. And similarly, we don't often report on the availability in traditional hospital beds, but there is quite a bit of space there as well. And then, of course, you'll have to remember that with college kids, you know, younger, healthier, generally uh, less likely to have se severe illness, less likely to need uh, hospital care. Um, so again, the strategy of, of finding those cases and containing them early so they don't spread to the community and those that are more vulnerable uh, will certainly help protect our hospital resources as well. Thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Hi, uh, Governor, this question is for you. Can you tell me a little bit more, please, about the uh, kind of rules that you are considering uh, making available to municipalities? I'm wondering if there is, would be any age limit for that curfew in particular. Um, no, it would just be on the hours of operation. Um, so, and if, that's, if it's just for bars, then it doesn't affect parties? Uh, the gathering size uh, would uh, would affect uh, some of the parties. They they can put limits yeah. on gathering size for their communities. All right, thanks. And also, um, I I'm sorry if I didn't if you answered this and I didn't quite hear it, but um, I couldn't tell if you're going to actively fundraise or hire campaign staff now. Now that you've won the primary. Yeah, there will be a more active campaign than you saw in the primary. Um, okay, so does that mean that you are going to acquire campaign staff or more staff? Uh, I think that would uh, that would be um, the next step forward. I have not done anything uh, at this point in time, but that would be the next step. Uh, what about participating in debates with David Zuckerman ahead of the general election? Oh, I'm sure. You know, I I'd offered to participate in the in the primary, um, and uh, obviously. Uh, I'll be uh, I'll be participating in the debates in the general as well. We'll see which ones, but uh, but I'm sure our voices will be heard. Um, okay, and I also have a question about um, K through 12 teachers and remote learning. Um, you said last week that teachers do have the flexibility to choose remote learning if they don't want to teach in person, but uh, we talked to teachers who say that they are being denied. Um, that choice, even if they're in high risk categories, uh, what's happening with that? Yeah, I don't think I said uh, that they uh, could choose, but it's up to the districts to work with uh, the teachers in order to accommodate that. And I think it's reasonable in some respects uh, when you have um, a, a, com a compromised health uh, risk uh, in your either in your household or yourself uh, that you would be able to work with the uh, school school district uh, to to make sure you work that out. Right. Hey, thank you so much. A3, WCAX. My question is likely for Dr. Levine. It's about pop-up testing sites. What is the current status of them? Do you all plan to keep doing them throughout the fall? And especially in Chittenden County, where most Vermonters live, how, are you planning to buff up sites there as well? Um, yeah, I'll let uh, Commissioner Levine answer that. But from my standpoint, we're going to continue um, probably uh, enhance as much as possible uh, the pop-up sites throughout Vermont it's not going to be just about the population centers because it gives us an idea of what's happening around the state when we have these pop-up sites so we want to accommodate everyone but we've been uh, fairly active in uh, different areas in Winooski and Burlington and so forth so um, we'll continue uh, with that approach and, and hopefully enhance it a bit Dr. Levine That was a wonderful response, and just to add to that, um, 
We have started to increase the capacity of each pop-up site as well, slightly. Um, and as we, you know, what we have to be protective of in the pop-up sites is not that we don't have people to collect the specimens. Uh, we want to make sure we have timely turnaround of the specimen result uh, and the capacity to have labs process all of those. And we continue to be working hard in that arena uh, so that we'll have uh, a depth of our portfolio for places to process the samples and get them back quickly. So that will continue. The pop-up sites are going to continue, as you just heard. Um, in addition, you have to realize that these are scheduled pop-up sites. That doesn't account for a pop-up site that comes as needed uh, if there were an outbreak. Um, and so we're very strategic uh, in making sure that the pop-up site appears where it needs to, um, in addition to having that statewide perspective of making sure we're allowing citizens of the state to access a pop-up site depending on where they live uh, for more routine needs versus an outbreak where we would plant one there specifically for as many days as needed. Thank you. A quick, a quick follow-up. So just to clarify for people, who should be going to these scheduled pop-up sites and are there any plans for restrictions on who can get tested at them? Yeah, so the, the preference at the pop-up sites is that asymptomatic people go uh, because we do like symptomatic individuals to be connected with the healthcare system uh, and have their test ordered through their usual channels of their uh, primary care providers. But at the same time, um, there are many people who fall in this asymptomatic category um, who the pop-up sites might be appropriate for, um, whether they be people who are in quarantine because of travel arrangements and are looking to uh, exit quarantine earlier with a test, whether they be people who are a contact themselves, identified in the contact tracing scheme, whether they belong to a group that uh, undergoes testing at regular intervals, uh, whether they're part of the healthcare system or what have you and uh, can arrange to do it there. Uh, so there's a, a host of people who uh, would be appropriate for those sites. You know, we, we, do, we are trying to make sure that people who um, are just uh, interested in knowing uh, but don't really have a confirmed uh, risk factor for COVID, a confirmed uh, history of exposure. Um, we know already in Vermont that if you are one of those people, you don't actually have much chance of testing positive because we've done such extensive testing around the state for people with no symptoms and no risk factors or exposures. And uh, we're, we're finding the, the rate that the governor quoted way under 1% positive test results. Um, and I just remind people when, when we went to Manchester area um, because we wanted to survey that, uh, those two counties, Bennington and Wyndham counties, um, we tested over 1,600 people and had only a very few positives come of that. Uh, so Vermonters should be reassured about that at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, this is a question for Commissioner Pichak and it's about the updated travel map. This is on slide uh, 17. And I'm curious about the bottom three numbers, um, fewer than 400 active cases per million VT, then 400 to 799 active cases per million VT, and then 800 plus active cases per million VT. What is the significance of breaking out the active cases in Vermont compared to the other parts of the Northeast and the travel region? And why does the Northeast Kingdom show up as the darker blue? Yeah, so good questions, uh, Lisa. So we wanted to make sure that Vermonters were at least aware of what uh, their county um, rate was and where they would fall on our metrics that we're applying to the other states in our travel region. Um, as we said in the past, you know, those, those, those many different restart metrics, the syndromic surveillance, case, uh, positivity, uh, case growth, uh, hospital availability, those are the metrics that we measure ourselves against and Vermont against. We have more granular detail available to us about Vermont's data that we unfortunately don't have about every state or every county around us. 
So this is the proxy, the, the 400, 800, um, is the proxy for that type of data and how we apply it to the other states in our travel region. So really just for clarity and, and just for um, transparency, we wanted to include those same metrics for Vermont, and we have them in a different color to indicate that those metrics don't apply to Vermont. Um, you, as a Vermonter, need to be aware of the county that you're traveling to, um, and as you, as an out-of-state individual traveling to Vermont, need to be aware of the county that you're traveling from. Uh, in terms of the Northeast Kingdom, I think it's Essex County that is dark, um, and as you know, there's it's probably just about 6,000 people that live in Essex County, and I believe they had two cases in the last week or so. So just even that few of a case, number of cases in a small county can can make the number go up high. Got it. Thank you very much. John, John Dillon, VPR. Hello. Hi, John. Hello. Sorry. Um, I had a question for Dr. Levine on testing and um, and then the, the death data that was reported recently by the New York Times. It says that um, that Vermont it, they were reporting on deaths above normal throughout the country, and and Vermont had had a, a peak of 1.7 times above normal. Uh, it, the last week of July, and I, I know uh, Commissioner Pichak just said death is a, a lagging indicator, and I guess it is for a lot of things. But what is um, what do you attribute that to, and could it be undetected COVID cases? Um, John, I just I just want to be clear myself, and we've had five five deaths in the last two months, I believe. So and none of them came at the same time. So I'm curious as to what, what they reported. It was in July. They, they're reporting on all deaths that are above the normal rate mm -hmm. for a particular area. So they broke it down state by state. Okay. And they're, they're just saying this is a phenomenon that's happening around the country. Uh, and they're raising the question, could it be that there are many cases that are undetected? And I, I wanted to see what Dr. Levine, sure. what he thought of that, that thesis. John, thanks for the question. I was losing sleep the last several nights that I would get that question. So uh, I had the team do a little background research for me. So just so everyone out there understands what the New York Times article was trying to say, they were looking at 2000. Uh, 20 and comparing it to 2017 to 2019 and looking on a weekly basis to see what the death rate in general would be during those times and they essentially picked out where the greatest discrepancy was in these death rates comparing the previous years with the current year and they came around the week of around July 25th for us now, as you'll recall um, as the governor said, we were not experiencing really almost any deaths uh, from COVID. However, there are still deaths from many other conditions. And the concern of the writers of the article was that states are undercounting COVID-related deaths because there's got to be a reason that their death rate would have been higher during this period of time. So it must be that COVID played a role and they just didn't recognize that. So we tried to take a look at that. Now, when we classify a death in Vermont as a COVID-19 death, if you look at a death certificate, COVID-19 can appear in the first line. The cause of death was COVID-19. But it could also say, the cause of death was pneumonia uh, or a heart attack. And then further down the death certificate, it might say as a consequence of COVID-19, and that would count as a COVID-19 death. But it might say neither of those. It might say the patient had COVID-19 three months before, but the person, the physician signing the death certificate felt that in some way that contributed even though they clearly didn't die of their active infection because it happened three months before, but the patient never really 
recovered in a way that you couldn't rule out COVID had totally drained them of all their energy and adversely affected all of their other chronic conditions that may have caused their death. We even count those as COVID deaths in Vermont. So we're kind of bending over backwards to try to uh, cast as wide a net as possible to make sure that any case that has some connection with COVID, even if it was just a contributory cause, gets listed that way. So we looked at this period in time, and indeed there were more deaths in Vermont than usual. But I have to say that if you go week by week by week uh, through any month of the year, some, sometimes you'll find that the rate in 2017 to 19 was only 80% of what we had in 2020. Other times you'll find another week was 130% of what we had um, in 2020. So it's very variable. We looked at the specific time frame they chose, because on the graph in the article they showed the week of concern, and admittedly didn't do a hugely scientific data analysis, but looked at eyeballing the kinds of causes of death. And the predominant causes of death were cancer and heart disease, which are always vying for number one and number two in our state on a daily, monthly, or yearly average anyways. They're always very close. They accounted for the majority, and then a smaller number had a respiratory cause of death, which is typical uh, because prior to COVID, uh, pneumonia is always, unfortunately, a common cause of death, especially in the most frail in our population. It's the kind of added insult that um, brings them to that point in their lifespan, unfortunately. So there was an average number of cases of those as well. So I know I've given you a long-winded answer, but I, I had to do that to show that we really are trying to look at this. And we're not finding any systemic or systematic um, problem in how we're classifying the deaths or in um, potentially leading us to undercount deaths uh, that might be related to COVID. And I can tell you, I know our medical examiner's office is very keyed into this and is always working hard to make sure that they've included this in their possibilities, even to the point of sometimes taking a sample to test for COVID uh, at the time of death, just so they can be sure that it had no role uh, in that person's death. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, and, and quickly, there's been also a lot of press about saliva testing. And I wondered if you're comfortable or feel that it's getting to the stage where that technology can be used for rapid screening uh, here in Vermont instead of even with the short time frame that we have from test to result, uh, whether, whether it could be used to speed up that process. Yeah, I'd like you to ask me that question at a future press conference because literally yesterday I tasked my uh, public health lab and microbiology team with the task of reassessing saliva testing in terms of uh, its performance characteristics, all the things you've asked for, so that we could see if we should be embracing it as one of our strategies. I, w I will say that uh, we, we think it's getting closer to prime time, and so there may actually be a uh, reasonable strategy we could have. But we'd also want to know that it had advantages in terms of perhaps turnaround time, as you implied, perhaps uh, utilizing different reagents and not overtaxing some of our current systems uh, where the supply chain might be more vulnerable. Um, and so we'd have to look into all of that. But, but that's what the team is doing uh, as we speak. So we'll, we'll report back on that. Okay. And just one quick one for the governor. Um, I'm not sure if these rules that you're talking about sort of empowering communities with to restrict uh, public gatherings and so forth. There are, um, would that be, so for all communities, I, I, I heard about one UDM student, and I know an anecdote doesn't make a story, but he was coming back a week early to go to a big party in the uh, Mad River Valley. Um, presumably that could be a situation of concern. So would all towns have these disabilities? Yes. To, uh, to, to, yeah, the, the simple answer is yes. Every community would have the ability uh, through their governance uh, body uh, to make this decision. 
um, what's best for their own community. So, yeah, every every town and village uh, can do this. Okay, thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Governor, in following up on some of the education issues, uh, I know of a, a teacher who's going to be required to teach more than double uh, their class size and, and reach out to, an, in fact, another town, so not even students you know. And um, I know you have concerns about K-5 education, uh, not being in person, and other circumstances as well. Special education could be a big deal. Would you consider um, turning and perhaps uh, mandating certain statewide educational practices if it turns out that things are not working out uh, come the fall? Yeah, that, that would obviously be the very last resort. Um, I believe that we can get there. Um, we have to, uh, to give, allow for flexibility uh, to prove ourselves. And I think the, the sooner we get back into some sort of um, normalcy uh, in terms of our educational process, the better off we'll be. Uh, but that may take a little time, uh, admittedly. And so we'll, um, we'll see how it works on September 8th. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, again, all work together in order to make this happen for our children. Uh, great. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, one of the questions that, that was raised to me was whether college students would be counted as Vermont cases, uh, out-of-state college students, or would be, they be counted in their own state? I know this issue has come up before, you know, someone from out-of-state being tested here is, a, is not a Vermont case, but how, how does this fall? How do these college, how would these college students? Yeah, so when the college students are arriving here to live here and pursue their studies, um, that case will be considered as a Vermont case. The case that I did mention, the one case that uh, prior to arrival, that will still obviously be counted in the state where that student resided because they never left. Uh, so they're still considered a, uh, a case in that state. All right, great. Simple answer. Thank you very much. Steve, NEK TV. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, thank you. Um, a quick one for the doctor and the governor, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, have you had a chance to uh, to look at the, uh, the so-called uh, Russian vaccine? And um, are you concerned that with the speed that they're working on these vaccines, we might see something similar um, to the swine flu thing in 76, where you'd see stuff further down the road that might not have been caught in the preliminary trials. Uh, Steve, I, I do want to remind you, we have a travel restriction, so I doubt that uh, he's actually seen this uh, Russian vaccine that may or may not exist. Yeah. I just wondered if you'd, you'd read anything about it. Either that or I just didn't quarantine when I came back. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've read a lot, but the most telling thing, I can keep the answer crisp, the most telling thing is the U.S. government was offered by the leader of uh, Russia uh, to be able to have some of this vaccine, and they have not accepted that offer at this point in time. And a repeat of the, the, the swine flu thing with the, with the, the quickness of the, uh, the, the speed of the vaccine development. Yeah, are you, are you speaking of vaccine development in general or the Russian one specifically? No, no, our uh, Western vaccines. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think uh, to, to reframe the question, any harm from a vaccine, um, because of the speed of vaccine development. That should be a concern, uh, but once we see the uh, process that has been gone through from a scientific standpoint, in terms of the size of the population that's been tested, the uh, incidence of any adverse events that have occurred in that population, uh, I think there'll be a lot more comfort. Because you're, you're right, there are some things um, that happen very rarely whether it's a vaccine or just a new medication on the market, that you don't even see those until it's been out there for several months. But those are so rare 
uh, that clearly the majority of the population would benefit by having got the vaccine. Then there are things that you see in some of the trials that clearly can't be rare, but then the question is, are they uh, significant enough that you wouldn't want anybody to get the vaccine? Um, and that can be determined because we'll have seen those during these trials. Um, so, you know, um, you're right. The statistics today that I've heard quoted are that in excess of 30% of the U.S. population, when surveyed, closer to 40%, would say they wouldn't want to receive this vaccine. Uh, and they don't even know anything about it yet, and we don't even know there is a vaccine. Uh, but that's their stance, uh, which is reflective of, I'm sure, a lot of uh, things going on in our country right now. But I think it's the onus of the medical and healthcare uh, establishment in our country to recognize that kind of survey data and say, we have to be extra careful and we have to be uh, able to, with confidence, assure the population that this vaccine is not only going to free up their lives again and let them uh, move beyond this pandemic, but it's going to be safe for them. So I think there's extra pressure on just knowing the nature of what's going on in the country now. So that should make us feel, I think, more confident. Great, thank you. Uh, Governor, um, regarding the, the pond, as we call it up here, I'm just real close to JP. Uh, regarding the, the Ponzi Peak scheme, um, is there any, are there any investigations into uh, the state culpability, uh, seeing as how the, the state of Vermont uh, put its imprimatur on it and, you know, and assured the investors of the safety and the oversight uh, of these programs? Um, I, I mean, even though a lot of us from the beginning thought it was like a repeat of the musical, the music band, uh, I mean, it was allowed to go forward. I, I, do you see any uh, culpability or responsibility by uh, state officials who put their stamp of approval on this, uh, this whole fiasco? Yeah, uh, the simple answer is that there is uh, questions about that and there is uh, a case developing in some respects. I think I'd let Mr. Pichak answer that directly. Sure. Thanks for the question, Steve. So, so certainly, um, our first priority in you know 2015, 2016 was investigating um, the underlying fraud and making sure we understood exactly what happened and where the money went. And like I said, tracing every uh, investor penny. Uh, once that case, the civil case was brought um, and successfully litigated to you know a good conclusion. We certainly were also interested in what lessons could be learned, you know, about the state's participation. You know, dating back all the way uh, to when the regional center was open in the late 1990s. So, um, we did do at our department uh, a dig, a deep dive, uh, an investigation uh, into, um, you know, what were the uh, guardrails, what were the guardrails that were lacking, that allowed something like this uh, to happen. And that report is public. I think we completed it about two and a half years ago. Um, others in state government have have looked at the same. Um, you know, uh, we work closely with Mike Goldberg, the federal receiver. Uh, we've worked closely with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Certainly, if we ever found anything that would give us concern, uh, we would have quickly turned that over to the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, they have looked at all the same documents that we have, and, and they've decided to bring um, the indictments against the defendants, uh, Kiros and Bill Stanger, primarily. And uh, what, uh, what, if anything, uh, can be done to, uh, to, to, to help out, uh, say, Newport with that, uh, with the giant smoking hole they're left with on Main Street? Uh, could there be any uh, attachment of any monies involved to help remediate or uh, reimburse the city uh, to at least turn the thing into a park or something? Yeah, so that's a good question as well. So certainly when, when the state settled its lawsuit against Ariel Kiros and Bill Stanger, that was uh, top of mind for us. Uh, we had about a $2 million settlement uh, combined with those two individuals, made up largely of property transfers to the state. Um, but as the governor made sure. clear, um, you know, that money uh, is set to be uh, set aside for development uh, in the Northeast Kingdom, in, in Newport specifically. Um, but 
Uh, I think we'd rather um, work with them and, and figure out what's the best use of that uh, $2 million proceeds. Okay, great. Um, so, the, if, so what you're basically saying is investigations are continuing on the state level. Yeah, and I, and I would call those investigations into, um, you know, uh, what, uh, where were the breakdowns, you know, where could things be improved? I, I wouldn't, they're not criminal investigations. Sure. Would, would the results of any of these, uh, are, are these people, are these people still employed by the state? Would they, would they lose their, uh, would they lose their jobs or anything like that? You know, we, I think we want to wait to see what the report finds. The outcome is. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Rutland Harold. Not sure if this is a question for the governor or Dr. Levine, um, but there's been some talk about uh, uh, steps being taken to make sure that the colleges can reopen safely and that college students be safe. But of course, these things happen in the community. Uh, we have one of them, Castleton, is a college town. Um, so have any steps been taken to uh, kind of outreach to the community, to the wider outside the uh, college campus community, uh, to, to how they can best prepare to have an influx of new people who potentially could be uh, carrying a disease? Well, again, we have uh, our pop-up testing uh, capabilities throughout the state uh, coming to that region uh, from time to time. Uh, as well, as you heard earlier, uh, we're allowing municipalities to uh, take uh, precautions themselves with gathering sizes and, and uh, limits on hours of uh, bar service if they have them in their uh, communities. But uh, obviously, we want to make sure the colleges and universities are working with their communities uh, to give them faith in, in what they're uh, doing. I'll ask Dr. But, but I'm I'm sorry, I, I, well, I guess I'm thinking about coffee shops in the area, thinking about uh, homes that rent uh, room students, things like that that aren't necessarily municipality issues, um, but are uh, going to bring contact between, uh, again, a group of people who might be coming from out of state, um, and, and some of these people have probably been providing these services to college students for years, uh, and suddenly they're in a slightly different posture because uh, of COVID. So I'm just wondering if there's been any how we should say if you're having, you know, if you if you have a large student population that you serve at a grocery store or a coffee shop or whatever, um, you know, here's some things to be mindful of and, and here's some communication you might need to have with the college. I, I don't know, just various things that might uh, that might how we to the to the community because, as I said, a, a college isn't just limited to its campus; it's part of the community. Dr. Levine. I think one thing I can say from the outstart, uh, outset, and uh, this isn't going out on a limb, is that the coffee shop in the hypothetical community that we're talking about is actually going to know more about that student than they know about a person coming from Massachusetts, Delaware, California, wherever, um, who is or isn't quarantining when they arrive. Because the college students that are coming from all these places are being tested on the first day they arrive. They're being tested a week later. They're being tested on a testing schedule for surveillance. And in that first week that they've arrived, they're on kind of a college campus quarantine and um, not interacting with the community at large at that point in time. So if you will, we're creating a setting that we know where there was disease and have already isolated that disease out. We know where there are contacts and those contacts have been quarantined. And we know uh, after several weeks when there may be more engagement between the campus and the community uh, that we essentially started with a community that uh, we could not measure any disease by our viral testing protocols. Uh, so the community should feel a sense of comfort related to that, more so than with just general tourists coming to the state. The other part is uh, I actually don't want the coffee shop to do anything special because the coffee shop already has its sign up saying you need a mask on. The coffee shop is part of a community that says we can't be a coffee shop and have indoor business if we don't have our tables set up a certain way and a certain distance. 
Uh, so we want everyone to continue to obtain to uh, uh, obey the uh, kind of guidance that we give everybody in Vermont, and especially give the businesses uh, as they interact with people in Vermont. So you know, nothing stops at the campus community border. Uh, the same rules are in place on both sides of that line. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first is for, I believe, Commissioner Pichek. Um, you were speaking of the $2 million uh, worth of property settlement. Um, from um, Mr. Kiros, and I am curious: has the has the state liquidated that property yet? So, thanks for that question. We um, uh, the properties, I believe, are still owned by the state. They're not liquidated yet. There were a number of um, due diligence items that had to be done relating to title search and, and work of that nature until the settlement was uh, finalized and we took possession of the properties. Um, I do believe a realtor has been engaged and um, there are there is some marketing uh, of those properties, but uh, to my understanding, they're, they're still with the state uh, right now. But as you know, the market in Vermont is quite hot, so it would be a good time to um, double down on those efforts. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is, for the governor, uh, you've raised um, the, you've talked about how other governors are facing some of the same issues, or all of the same issues as Vermont is. Um, and I wonder, have you made efforts to try to put together um, a regional discussion of these issues so that the northeastern states at least can work together because right now it seems um, everyone is pursuing their own strategies and there seems to be very little discussion that I can see of what has been working and what hasn't been working and sharing of those efforts. Well, a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> we, um, I think most of the other states that I've encountered are using the same approach we are. Uh, they're very common in some respects, allowing the districts to have flexibility. Um, talk of a lot of hybrid uh, instruction, uh, some remote, some in-person in instruction, uh, and allowing the flexibility of the districts to determine that. So that's been fairly consistent. The only there may be uh, a couple of states who have, uh, have forced in-person instruction. Uh, there have been uh, states who haven't uh, mandated mass in, in school um, situations, uh, which we have. Uh, so uh, ours are different. And, and again, uh, New York, I think it was just last week, uh, who uh, the Governor Cuomo had come out to, uh, to say that they were moving forward with, uh, with the schools opening up. Um, so they were uh, much later uh, to, uh, to the table in some respects than we were. We've been working on this guidance and so forth for might be nine or ten weeks at this point. Um, so we, um, we want to hear. I, mean, I know um, uh, Secretary French uh, it talks on a weekly basis uh, with our counterparts uh, throughout the Northeast. So they are sharing ideas. and. Uh, and uh, different procedures. So it's not as though we're out on this alone. Uh, we are uh, working with others. Uh, and, and again, it's more, I, I don't think it's as much governor to governor as it is uh, secretary to secretary uh, of education. Uh, secretary, Deputy Secretary Boucher, uh, can you elaborate on that anymore? Sure, uh, thank you, Governor. Thank you for the question. Yes, um, we are having regular meetings um, with both other, uh, Secretary French, as you mentioned, is having both other meetings with um, both regionally and uh, nationally uh, groups of other secretaries or commissioners of education. Um, and we're meeting regularly. Uh, we use a lot of um, best practices that are emerging and um, collated 
through a national organization called um, the Council of Chief State School Officers, uh, which does a really nice job of um, providing materials for chiefs and deputies and our, our staff and teams to actually use. Um, and then I would also just, um, again, state that within our Within Vermont, we we meet regularly with both um, superintendents, but also with representatives um, weekly of the Vermont NEA, um, Superintendents Association, Principal Association, um, uh, Vermont School Board Association, and some others. So um, I just think it's important to put that in a little bit of context as well. Thanks. Thank you. Greg Bennington Banner. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Governor, the primary election appears to have smashed previous turnout records with many voters taking advantage of early voting through mail or drop off. What was your reaction to that turnout result? And would you support making early voting outreach to the state employees this year a permanent part of voting or moving to vote by mail as five states have already already do? Um, well, first of all, I was thrilled uh, with the uh, the turnout in this last election. I've I lamented on the fact that we don't uh, have enough participation. Uh, it paled in comparison in other years. Uh, when you when you think about the the population that can vote uh, versus uh, the population that does vote, um, we uh, we should do better. Um, so I was uh, thrilled with the re response. I think this is a step in the right direction. Uh, in terms of uh, changing our approach uh, again this was not uh, I just want to remind you this was our status quo this was what we had in place yeah. this isn't this wasn't any different than any other election except for uh, a higher participation rate so uh, the difference was the Secretary of State had sent out a, a notice um, just telling people you could vote uh, by by absentee uh, ballot or vote by mail and, uh, and uh, but it's something that's been in place for quite some time in Vermont. So that is not any different. The general election, I believe the Secretary of State is still uh, continuing forward with the, uh, the concept of, of mailing a ballot to every Vermonter. Uh, that's what's going to be different. So we'll see how that works mm -hmm. out. Uh, but, uh, but again, I think it, it uh, speaks volumes uh, to how far we've come in terms of uh, our uh, uh, vote by mail um, um, structure that we have in place right now. I mean, it's it works pretty well when you when you received even received the uh, the results uh, early in the in the evening. It didn't seem even with the uh, higher numbers, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't see any delay in the in the results. So I think everyone uh, did a great job. I think the Secretary of State uh, deserves a lot of credit, but I also uh, want to uh, uh, to give the town clerks, uh, city clerks, and so forth a lot of credit uh, because a lot of work goes on behind the scenes uh, to make all that happen sending mailing out the ballots as well as receiving them and counting them and so forth so i think everyone uh, did a great job okay uh, one quick follow-up uh what are your feelings on the president acknowledging he's slowing the united states postal service to prevent more voting by mail or discourage it and have you reached out to our congressional congressional delegation or to the Governor's Association regarding that situation? Yeah, I think uh, uh, this is uh, unfortunate uh, when you're trying to squelch uh, the voices of, of Americans and, uh, and squelch their opportunity to vote. I, I think that uh, during these times, we should be doing all we can uh, to make sure that everyone is counted um, and has their voices heard uh, through the ballot box. So uh, in terms of uh, much too quick, uh, we haven't, uh, I haven't spoken to uh, the, the National Governors Association at this point in time about this p provision in particular. So I'm sure it'll be a topic in the next week or so. Okay, because the you know, mail delivery has a lot of other impacts in addition to, uh, in addition to ballots, yeah. uh, checks, medications, et cetera. Yeah, so. especially, especially during these times when we're asking people to, to stay home more. Um, not to uh, interact and, and uh, utilizing the mail service has been been helpful as well as with the uh, private delivery. So, yeah, this is the wrong time uh, to be pulling back uh, in terms of uh, mail del delivery. All right, that concludes my question. Thank you. Thank you. Courtney, Local 22. Good 
Hello. Um, just a couple quick questions. First, for the governor. Um, so Biden has recently said that all governors should mandate masks, and obviously we already have a mask mandate. But I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that, or thoughts on you know making it absolutely mandatory. Well, I think every state has to do what they think is right uh, for their uh, their states in particular. But uh, I think the the science has evolved on this. And, uh, and shows that uh, the more we wear masks, the more we uh, physically distance ourselves, uh, the, the sooner uh, we'll get through this. Um, so uh, from, a, from a, a national perspective, um, if we could all just wear masks for a few weeks, uh, we would be so much further ahead. So I think he's on the right, uh, right track there. Mm -hmm. And just another quick question um, regarding colleges. Um, we've had viewers and people say that they've already been passing, um, you know, like UVM or college parties around the Burlington areas. And I know you said um, that towns will, you know, have, be able to limit people size. But I was just wondering, you know, will people be able to police those, or will that be on the college for policing those, or the town? Uh, I think it's going to be a, a combination of all of the above. I think we have to, uh, again, if we want to. Uh, continue to suppress this virus. Uh, we're going to have to limit uh, the amount of uh, engagement. I'm concerned uh, about some of those uh, parties and clubs and bars uh, that uh, that attract uh, many of our youth, many of our college students. So that's why we put into place uh, the actions in the executive order that we did uh, to try and prevent some of that. But uh, but we're all going to have to again be nimble, work on this work together uh, in order to, uh, to prevent this uh, from uh, the virus from spreading. Okay, thank you. Kevin, seven days. Can you hear me, Governor? I can. Thanks so much for taking so many questions. Um, this is a quick follow-up on that uh, last question about um, giving local municipalities disability. Don't don't municipalities already have the ability to, to issue curfews in their own communities if they see public health risks? I would think that would be a power that a mayor like Mayor Moreau Weinberger would already have. Yeah, Can there's, you clarify that for there's, me? A, there's a technical issue with that, and uh, I would have to refer to my general counsel because she, uh, she Jay, can, can give us the exact provision there. Um, but uh, but I, don't believe, I don't believe they can go further. Uh, than the governor, but uh, and I don't know if Jay is on the on the call. No. Um, what I can do, uh, Kevin, is have uh, have Jay get in touch with you, and uh, so that you get this uh, correct and exact. That'd be great. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Um, I'd also like you to if, could could you weigh in a little bit on the qualifications for lieutenant governor? Obviously, we just had a Democratic primary where someone who has never held public office before has been chosen as the Democratic nominee. You're someone who served in the legislature for quite a spell before you served as lieutenant governor, and now you're governor. Um, can, you, can you speak to the qualifications for lieutenant governor's uh, position and, and whether you think public service uh, an elected office is a, should be a qualifier for that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. If it should be a qualifier. Um, it certainly helps to understand the legislative process, um, and because a lot of what you do is, is presiding over the over the Senate and and watching legislation and making rulings and so forth. But um, I don't believe you have to have a, a, you know any credentials to do that in some respects. Um, but. Uh, uh, but certainly, uh, the position's important. Uh, it'd be important for me uh, as well, and uh, for me uh, having someone that I can uh, work with and rely on, and uh, and uh, work through some of the issues, uh, and it has the same um, same type of commitment uh, that I do to uh, to what I see as best for Vermont. But uh, as far as the the qualifications, I uh, I don't believe that they're there needs to be anything specific for qualifications. Well, would you think it would be beneficial? Um, well, again, it certainly helps to understand the process, but I don't think that prohibits anyone uh, from from learning and doing the job. We, you know, there's um, 
you have the Secretary of the, the Senate uh, that uh, does a, a wonderful job in trying to guide uh, people through the process. So uh, it's something that can be learned. Okay, and then my last question I think is for um, uh, Dr. Levine, and that is in the, in the new cases today, I think I see 17 new cases today, and, and forgive me if you've addressed the, the origins of these cases, but um, it looks as though 17 new cases is the highest uh, number of new cases in the state in the last six weeks. Do I have that right? I, I, I'm, I'm working off of data from the dashboard and trying to make sure that's accurate, but I believe it to be true that I don't see a number that high since um, the 1st of July. Can you speak to that little mini spike and um, to what extent and, and how many of those cases appear to be attributed to you know, college students returning to the area? And if, and if it's not that, is there something else going on? Yeah, thanks for that question, because we asked uh, many of the same questions this morning, actually. I think we've had another 17-day within the last few weeks, because that number really rings a bell for me, uh, so sooner than July 1st. Um, but, you know, every week we, we go from zero to two to a half a dozen to something in the teens. So this isn't totally out of the ordinary, to be honest. Um, I can tell you that... Uh, these are all reported from late results coming from the lab, so that none of them have actually had the investigation that we would want to know more about uh, by the time we talk about them early in the morning. Uh, that's ongoing as the morning evolves. I can tell you, though, that the um, numbers of cases were uh, close to 50% of them were in Chittenden County, but the rest were distributed uh, throughout the state. And looking at the age ranges, there were some very young and some older and some in between. And it doesn't look like uh, uniformly or not even close to uniformly was there a college age range uh, amongst those 17 cases. So we'll learn a lot more uh, as the teams work on them today because that's what they'll be doing. But right now, um, no specific relationships, no specific uh, uh, designation of why the number is the number or where they're coming from in terms of uh, their exposure history. Okay, excellent. Uh, good luck trying to figure it out. Uh, I appreciate your time. Pam Davis. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, Governor, this is just a, this is a, I'd like to shift gears here from COVID uh, uh, to healthcare reform, which I think is a very difficult issue. I can't even imagine how your team could do any better on COVID. I mean, maybe it could, but I'm not sure how, but the same can't be really said of the healthcare reform. And so the, uh, and, and the, so the healthcare reform is a little bit right now, like the piece of the iceberg that's below the surface of the ocean, but it's right there and it's very big. The uh, and it's kind of it's coming up right now. The healthcare reform itself is on the cusp of its most difficult decisions. And on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, we start the uh, Green Mountain Care Board starts looking at all of the budgets for the uh, for the for Mont, all of Vermont hospitals, and the decisions they make there will provide the underpinning for the system for the next several years. Anyway, my question is for Mike Pichak. Um one of the most difficult questions is how to manage um, the money, the very significant piece of health care money in Vermont that flows through Blue Cross. And Blue Cross is subject to, to uh, two types of regulation, as you know. Um, one is yours. Um, you have to keep Blue Cross, uh, your job is to keep Blue Cross alive, and the Green Mountain Care Board's job is to keep the Blue Cross co uh, cost down as low as possible to make health care insurance affordable. My question is this, have you thought about and do you think, have you thought about and do you have any ideas about how we might go forward? Looking at the Blue Cross budget, um, if, the, if the DFR is simply looking at the amount of money that Blue Cross spends, okay, without any uh, knowledge or involvement in what the Blue Cross spends the money for. And the, uh, the, the equation is entirely the opposite for the Green Mountain Care Board. They don't, they, their job is to keep 
Blue Cross Alive, their job is to try and figure out what they should spend. I'm trying to figure out whether there's any way that you could do that under your current uh, legislative constraints, whether you can look at what Blue Cross spends their money for, because that's the essence of health care reform. Can you do that? Do you want to do that now? If you can't do that now, do you, do you think that you have the, should have the power to do that? Commissioner Piche. Good luck. Hi, Ham. How are you? I'm good, Mike. I'm sorry. I just, I, I think that's just the most critical question out there. Yeah, it's a good question and really um, timely as well as the Green Mountain Care Board is set to deliver the rates for Blue Cross and MVP today and the hospital budget review is set to begin last, next week, as you mentioned. So, you know, when we look at Blue Cross Blue Shield, certainly we're interested generally in sort of what percentage of their um, premium is going to pay claims. And as you know, you know, that number fluctuates around 95, 93, 94, 95 percent of basically premiums coming in are going out to pay claims with the rest for administrative costs, like 6 percent or so for salaries and yep. IT and the like and you know that's really good when you compare it to other Blue Cross plans so just in terms of that percentage that's certainly a, a positive thing for them as a company and for Vermont uh, and for Vermont um, policyholders because they get uh, their bang for their buck if you will but then when you look at that 93 94 95 percent of premiums and I think your question is sort of you know what types of services are Blue Cross Blue Shield paying for um, you know are they paying for surgeries and uh, certain locations? Are they paying for uh, more complicated surgeries in certain locations? Should that be the case or should the care be split up in a different way? So do we have the authority to do that? I think it's a question that's much larger than just um, than us and just payers, commercial payers. There's, you know, there are plans that um, are outside of the commercial space and ERISA, there are government payers as well. I think all of those have to be part of that conversation. Certainly there are issues about health access, how, you know, how can someone get access to the health care they need issues about quality certainly yep. as well uh, which are critical and important i think some of the issues that we have are legal issues though there's certain network adequ adequacy laws at the state and federal level that would probably need to be addressed um, so i think it's really um, a broader stakeholder group that would need to really tackle that issue both on the payer side and the provider side and 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 uh you know legislation i think would would be needed Right, I, I, I agree. Thanks for that. I, uh, I, but I, I think that the, I'm not sure where, where you stand on it. Do you, would you like to do it, or are you happy with the, with the sort of guardrails that is just exist in the current statute? So, I mean, I think, you know, whether it's DFR, whether it's AHS and their health care reform efforts, and Mike Smith probably would like to talk more about those. I think uh, having, you know, most states don't have as many, you know, cooks in the kitchen, if you will, when it comes to health care. Uh, largely, there's um, right. there's there's just sort of, sort of fewer players, and that does make reform easier in some instances. So, um, you know, but uh, but I think some combination of AHS and DFR, and we obviously work very well together, um, would certainly be appropriate. Right. Thank you very much, Alan Burlington Free Press. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Um, Hi, my question is for uh, Dr. Levine. Um, you mentioned uh, one positive um, college case from a preliminary test. I'm wondering if you'd be at liberty to say which college that is. It's the one, one positive that's out of state. You're talking about the one that's out of state? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, that was the University of Vermont. They, they are having their students do a saliva-based test out of state. Um, the results get known before they embark on their travels. That's it. Thank you so much. Again, I guess that wraps it up. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Tuesday.